Worshiping through the battle. That's the title of my message this morning, Worshiping Through the Battle. I just want to pray. Father, I thank you, God, for your sovereignty. I thank you, Lord, that you're here right now with us, Jesus. You're ministering to each one, God. And I thank you for your power. I thank you for your love. I thank you for your faithfulness, God. You see us through battles, Lord. You promise in your word. You tell us in your word that we will see trials. We will go through tribulation. But you also promise that you will be with us. You will never forsake us and never leave us, God. So as we look at your word this morning, God, I pray that you will speak to each person, Lord. Speak to me, God. I pray that each person here will have a greater revelation of who you are in our lives, God, and that we will draw closer to you this day through worship, Father. That's what you desire. You desire intimacy with us, God. So as we turn our focus to your word, Lord, speak, Lord, for we're here to listen. We're here to hear from you, Jesus, in your name. Amen. Well, we all experience trials. The Bible tells us that we will see trials in our lives, that we will go through difficult times and difficult circumstances. And in James chapter 1, James, the brother of Jesus, wrote this, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, or consider it all joy when you fall into various trials. I find that so difficult to do sometimes. I find that so difficult, but Jesus says, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience, but let patience have its perfect work that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. We don't always understand why we go through a particular trial, and sometimes in the middle of the trial. It's very difficult. It's painful. But God promises that his purpose is to grow our faith, to develop our faith. He wants us to be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. That's his promise. God wants you to know that he hasn't forgotten you or deserted you or left you to suffer through it on your own. But he is with you to strengthen you, to lift you up, And to assure you that he will never leave you or forsake you. He is a God of love and mercy and understands completely what you're going through. The trials that each one of us experience will probably be different for each one of us. Depending on maybe our personality type or circumstances that we've lived through and experienced. um, Among other things. So... Sometimes when we look at somebody going through a particular trial that we say, oh, that's not such a big deal. I don't know. Why are they struggling with that? It's their trial, their struggle. And so likewise, when we're going through a particular trial that is really difficult for us and somebody else might not see it as difficult, it's still painful and it's very trying and difficult for us. But God promises that The trials that we go through, he will give us strength to go through them. 1 Corinthians 10, 13 says, No temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not allow you to to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will also make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. The word tempted or temptation here in the Greek can mean to be tested or to experience trial. And we know that Jesus experienced uh, incredible trial, testing while here on earth. Hebrews 4.15 says, For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. And that same word tempted is the same word in the Greek as we found in 1 Corinthians 10.13. So as Jesus He's experienced, he experienced testing, tempting, but without sin. So he understands when we go through different trials that he can come alongside us and help us through them. How do you persevere when there are so many thoughts rushing through your mind that may be condemning you, ridiculing you, reminding you of your past failures and mistakes, 
or screaming at you that everything is going to come crashing down upon you. How do you do that? I know I've felt those very things in my life. There's a God who is for you and not against you. The devil comes to tell us, he puts thoughts in our mind saying that we're no good or look at this wrong thing you did. Remember that. You can't do it. Well, that's part is actually true. We can't do it. But through Christ, through God, we can do all things who strengthens us. Romans 8, 31 to 39 says, What shall we say then to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died and furthermore is also risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. Jesus is interceding for us right now, right here in this service. If you're going through a trial right now, Jesus is interceding for you. That is amazing. It blows my mind to think the King of kings, the Lord of lords is interceding on my behalf because he loves me. He loves you. He's not forgotten about you. Hallelujah. Who, can, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress persecution or famine, nakedness or peril or sword. As it is written, for your sake, we are killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Have you ever felt like that? Have you ever felt like that? Yet in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height or depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Hallelujah. Praise be to the King of Kings. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. That's who we are in Christ. Our true position in Christ. God has our back. He is for you and not against you. He understands your weaknesses and your strengths. How do we endure these times of testing? How do we endure them? What is God wanting us to learn as we persevere through times of testing? And in some cases, through times of extreme trial and pain. How do we lessen the burden of the trial or battle and grow in our relationship with the Lord? Meditating on God's word is so important and so key. And also having believers come around us and pray for us is so important and key. But this morning, I want to focus on worship. Worshiping in the midst of the battle is key. It's absolutely key. Worshiping him will give you strength. It will give you endurance and patience. Worshiping him will give you his perspective and will teach you about who he is. Worshiping him will give you peace. And worshiping him will give you the victory. Hallelujah. Will give us the victory. Hallelujah. Let's take a a moment and define worship. What is worship? So from Webster's Dictionary, it says, to regard with great or extravagant respect honor, or devotion, to regard with great or extravagant respect, honor, or devotion. Hallelujah. So that's what Jesus wants from us. I recently heard uh, Ravi Zacharias quote a definition of worship from uh, William Temple. He was the Archbishop uh, of Canterbury from 1942 to 1944 uh, when he died at the age of 63. But Archbishop William Temple defined worship in this way. I love this. I love this definition. Worship is the submission of all of our nature to God. It is the quickening of the conscience by his holiness, the nourishment of mind with his truth, the purifying of imagination by his beauty, 
the opening of the heart to his love, the surrender of will to his purpose, all this gathered up in adoration, the most selfless emotion of which our nature is capable. Hey, hallelujah. Let me read that again. Worship is the submission of all of our nature to God. It is the quickening of the conscience by his holiness, the nourishment of mind with his truth, the purifying of imagination by his beauty, the opening of the heart to his love, the surrender of will to his purpose. All this gathered up in adoration, the most selfless emotion of which our nature is capable. I just love that. It encaptures our whole being, our whole soul, our mind, our will, and emotions as we give our all to Jesus because he's given us his all. He desires us to give him our all. I remember an occasion about 25 years ago when the Lord was beginning to teach me about worshiping through the battle. I was going through a time in my life, I was farming at the time, and um, we weren't making enough money to provide for my family. So it was a time of great, I felt failure as a man, a husband, and a provider of my family. The feelings of failure were overwhelming. So in our culture, I feel that there can be a, a pressure to identify with what we do as a li uh, for our living. Because what's the first question we ask people after we find out what their name is? What do you do for a living, right? So there's that pressure, I think, that we feel, and it, it causes us to identify with our particular occupation. But that's not God's desire. That's not God's plan. So he wants us to identify with him. So in a case of, at this time I was farming, my identity should have been, I'm a Christian, I'm a blood-bought child of the King of Kings, who happens to be a farmer. Right? But I didn't have that perspective. So I shared my troubles with Harvey, who encouraged me to spend time worshiping the Lord, even though I may not feel like doing it. And I can attest there's many times, many times where I don't feel like it. I just don't feel like it. I've had a bad day, feel maybe kind of grumpy or irritable, and I don't feel like worshiping Jesus, the King of Kings. But that's what he wants from us. So I remember I put on some worship music on the, in the stereo in our living room. I like putting on worship music. So, uh, and then I raised my hands and just kind of walked back and forth in the living room worshiping Jesus. And at first it felt mechanical and forced, but after a while it actually worked. So my perspective changed. I wish I could say that I have always followed this way of worshiping through each trial as they've come. It would have been so much easier and more rewarding as well. But God is gracious and he understands that we are growing in our faith and that we haven't yet arrived to full maturity. In fact, worshiping Jesus, I want to encourage you, if you are worshiping Jesus in the midst of your trial, don't give up. Persevere. Even though your situation, your circumstances don't change. And in this case for me, it didn't change for many years. But I want to encourage you to keep pressing on. Pressing on. It gives us his perspective because he is for us and not against us. Philippians 4, verses four chapter 4, verse 4 to 9 says, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to all men. The Lord is at hand. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there's any virtue and if there's anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. The things which you learned and received and heard and saw in me, these do, and the God of peace will be with you. The battle is in our mind. 
the devil comes to attack us and give us thoughts in our mind that would uh, try and rob, steal, kill, and destroy. The Bible says in John 10.10, 10, the thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. But I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. That's God's desire for us. That's God's desire for us. So as you worship the Lord, he will change your focus away from your difficult circumstance and onto his unfailing love and plan for your life. When your heart is focused on him, he is then able to speak to you, to heal you, to restore you, to give you instruction, wisdom, discernment, and his indescribable peace. I can tell you that when his peace comes in the midst of the storm, it is a most beautiful experience. And I'm sure that most of you know what I'm describing. Even though nothing may have changed outwardly, the peace of God comes to still the storm. Hallelujah. Colossians 3, 15 to 17 says, And let the peace of God rule, prevail, or abound in your hearts, to which also you were called in one body, and be thankful. Thankfulness is so important. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. There it is. It's right there in verse 16. Admonishing one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your heart. I think sometimes people who, um, I want to encourage you this morning. If you feel like you can't sing, Jesus gave you a voice, and you can sing. Just maybe some people don't like to sing or maybe don't enjoy singing, but Jesus wants to hear you sing. There's something about singing to Jesus. It makes us vulnerable, I know. And maybe if you can't carry a tune that well, you won't be on a worship team, and that's okay. But God wants to hear you sing. He wants to hear. He created every one of our voices, and he wants to hear you sing. So whether it's at home, here at church, I really encourage you to sing and to lift your voices to him. Why is worship so important? We all worship something, whether it be a relationship, possessions, or maybe a position of recognition. But worship unto the Lord will put him first place in your life and will give you his perspective so that you are in alignment with his will for your life. If you're out of his will, worshiping him will bring you help to bring you back into alignment with his will. If you're in his will but just going through a season of trial, you will be redirected away from the pain of the trial and back into focusing on the eternal perspective rather than the temporary discomfort and discouragement. And oh, discouragement is a joy killer. It's terrible. The enemy uses discouragement in our lives to lie to us, to deceive us, to break down relationships, to bring confusion, to instill fear, to bring condemnation, and to stop us from accomplishing God's will for our lives. That's what the devil wants to do to us. That's what he wants to accomplish in your life. He doesn't want you to do God's will. If he can get you focused on something else, on our problems, on our circumstances, we forget who is sovereign. We forget who is actually in control. Amen. That's the devil's trick. He uses discouragement to tear us down. But Jesus lifts us up. He comes and lifts us up. So as we focus on him and worship, well, however that may be, I'm not saying that you have to put on music and stand and walk back and forth in your living room like I did. It can be different for every person how he's made you. But I'm just saying that worshiping Jesus is so important. Worshiping him is the key. I've also found that just trying to stop thinking bad thoughts doesn't work. Just doesn't work. My mind, it just, it's just going all the time. Drives me nuts sometimes. 
but I can't, I have to fill my mind with good thoughts. You know, and in Philippians 4.8, we read it earlier, but let's read it again. Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, Whatever things are of good report, if there's any virtue, and if there's anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. And I know it's difficult. I know it so, can be so challenging to focus on the good things. Our minds, my mind anyway, it can be so easy to be distracted and to think wrong thoughts. Oh, this situation I'm going through right now, the worst is going to happen. I just know it. I've been disappointed before. I've been discouraged before. I've been let down before somehow. And I know this is just going to end up bad. But through all, God works through all things to bring good. He works all things for good to those who are called, to those who love Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. With God, all things are possible. Don't give up. God is not finished with you yet. He has a plan for you that is good, not harmful. A plan that will restore a relationship in your life that may have fallen apart. A plan that will restore the years that the locusts have eaten. Hallelujah. A plan that will be rewarding for you and those around you. He loves you and he's not forgotten about you. Hallelujah. He's right here right now. Isaiah 43, 1 to 3 says, Fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by your name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned, nor shall the flame scorch you, for I am the Lord your God. That's who we serve this morning. Great is his faithfulness. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I want to look at a story in the Old Testament in 2 Chronicles chapter 20. It's the story of King Jehoshaphat and how they were facing incredible intimidation and fear. At this time in the story of, or in the life of the nation of Israel, nation, uh, Israel was divided into two kingdoms. So remember, Saul was the first king, then David, and then his son Solomon. At the end of Solomon's reign, about 931 BC, the kingdom split into two parts. So there became northern kingdom in the northern part of Israel, and that made up about ten, the ten tribes of Israel. And then in the south, the uh, tribe of Benjamin and Judah and the Levites also joined together to um, make the kingdom of Judah. So King Jehoshaphat was the fourth king in the kingdom of Judah from when it split off in 931 BC. He was the king from about 830, 873 BC to 848 BC. So it's here we pick up the story from 2 Chronicles chapter 20. It happened after this that the people of Moab with the people of Ammon and others with them besides the Ammonites came to battle against Jehoshaphat. Then some came and told Jehoshaphat, saying, A great multitude is coming against you from beyond the sea, from Syria, and they are in Hazanon Tamar, which is En Gedi. And Jehoshaphat feared, he was fearful, and set himself to seek the Lord and proclaimed a fast throughout all Judah. So Judah gathered together to ask help from the Lord, and from all the cities of Judah they came to seek the Lord. Then Jehoshaphat stood in the assembly of Judah in Jerusalem in the house of the Lord before the new court and said, O Lord God of our fathers, are you not God in heaven? And do you not rule over all the kingdoms of the nations? And in your hand is there not power and might so that no one is able to withstand you? Are you not our God who drove out the inhabitants of this land before your people Israel and gave it to the descendants of Abraham, your friend, forever? And they dwell in it and have built you a sanctuary in it for your name, saying, If disaster comes upon us, sword, judgment, pestilence, or famine, 
We will stand before this temple and in your presence. For your name is in this temple and cry out to you in our affliction and you will hear and save. We are God's temple. We are God's temple. So as we cry out to Jesus, he will hear and save. Hallelujah. And now, here are the people of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir, whom you would not let Israel invade when they came out of the land of Egypt. But they turned from them and did not destroy them. Here they are, rewarding us by coming to throw us out of your possession, which you have given us to inherit. O oh, our God, will you not judge them? For we have no power against this great multitude that is coming against us, nor do we know what to do, but our eyes are upon you. Now all Judah with their little ones, their wives, and their children stood before the Lord. Then the Spirit of the Lord came upon Jehaziel, the son of Zechariah, the son of Benaiah, the son of Jeel, the son of Mataniah, a Levite of the sons of Asaph, in the midst of the assembly. And he said, Listen, all you of Judah and you inhabitants of Jerusalem and you, King Jehoshaphat. Thus says the Lord to you, do not be afraid nor dismayed because of this great multitude, for the battle is not yours, but God's. Tomorrow, go down against them. They will surely come up by the ascent of Ziz, and you will find them at the end of the brook before the wilderness of Jeruel. You will not need to fight in this battle. Position yourselves, stand still, and see the salvation of the Lord who is with you. O oh, Judah and Jerusalem, do not fear or be dismayed. Tomorrow go out against them, for the Lord is with you. And Jehoshaphat bowed his head with his face to the ground. And all Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem bowed before the Lord, worshiping the Lord. Then the Levites of the children of the Kohathites and of the children of the Korahites stood up to praise the Lord God of Israel with voices loud and high. So they rose early in the morning and went out into the wilderness of Tekoa. And as they went out, Jehoshaphat stood and said, Hear me, O Judah, and you inhabitants of Jerusalem. Believe in the Lord your God, and you shall be established. Believe his prophets, and you shall prosper. And when he had consulted with the people, he appointed those who should sing to the Lord and who should praise the beauty of holiness as they went out before the army and were saying, Praise the Lord, for his mercy endures forever. Now when they began to sing and to praise, the Lord set ambushes against the people of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir, who had come against Judah, and they were defeated. For the people of Ammon and Moab stood up against the inhabitants of Mount Seir to utterly kill and destroy them. And when they had made an end of the inhabitants of Seir, they helped to destroy one another. So when Judah came to a place overlooking the wilderness, they looked toward the multitude, and there were their dead bodies fallen on the earth. No one had escaped. When Jehoshaphat and his people came to take away their spoil, they found among them an abundance of valuables on the dead bodies, and precious jewelry, which they stripped off for themselves, more than they could carry away. And they were three days gathering the spoil because there was so much. And on the fourth day they assembled in the valley of Barakah, for there they blessed the Lord. Therefore the name of that place was called the valley of Barakah until this day. Then they returned, every man of Judah and Jerusalem, with Jehoshaphat in front of them, to go back to Jerusalem with joy, for the Lord had made them rejoice over their enemies. So when they came to Jerusalem with stringed instruments and harps and trumpets to the house of the Lord, and the fear of God was on all the kingdoms of those countries when they heard that the Lord had fought against the enemies of Israel, then the realm of Jehoshaphat was quiet for his God gave him rest all around. Now, can you picture this? Here's the kingdom of Judah, surrounded by the armies of other nations. Israel could have destroyed these nations earlier in their journey, but God had instructed them to leave them alone. Fast forward till now, and it looked like it was impossible. It was impossible for Judah to overcome them. 
It looked like Judah was going to be annihilated. And it kind of looked like God had set them up for failure. Have you ever felt like that? Feels like if God is not against us, but sometimes in our situations we lose our focus and it can feel like God's against us, but he's not. God had instead allowed this circumstance and event to show them his power and his love. He was still their God and he had not forgotten about them. Can you imagine the fear that would have gripped them? Tremendous fear. Here they are, men, women, children, about to be destroyed. There was no way out. They were completely surrounded. I take great comfort in this story. It's, it's ministered to me so many times over the years as I've gone through different trials. It is so wonderful. I can see the promise of God. If he was with Jehoshaphat and the nation almost 3,000 years ago, he's the same God yesterday, today, and forever. He is with us. He is not against us. And what's interesting is they feared. Jehoshaphat feared. Verse 3 talks about Jehoshaphat feared. Verse 15, it says, do not be afraid nor dismayed. So in other words, if they were being told not to be afraid, they must have been afraid. Verse 17 also says, do not fear or be dismayed. Tomorrow go out against them for the Lord is with you. So when fear comes to attack us, the way through it is to raise our hands, to seek the Lord and to worship him. The Bible often tells us about fear. I struggle with fear in my life. It's a battle that comes and goes. But to overcome it, it's worship. Worship and focusing on Jesus because he's the author and finisher of our faith and the work that he began in us, he will complete it. He will complete it until he comes again as we continue to seek him. Hallelujah. What was their response? I want to look at a number of points. Just go through them very quickly. What was their response to their situation? First, they inquired of the Lord. That should be our first response. Oh my goodness, if I'd done that every time of my life, it would have been so much better. <laughs> but that's what we should do. The first thing is to inquire of the Lord. The second thing is they proclaim the truth of who God is. Jehoshaphat said, O oh God of our fathers, are you not God in heaven? And do you not rule over all the kingdoms of the nations? And in your hand is there not power and might so that no one is able to withstand you? Hallelujah. It builds faith as we proclaim the truth of who God is in our circumstances. It builds faith in us and helps us to get our perspective correct. Third, they confess their problem to God. They said, look at these nations surrounding us about to destroy us. So God he knows about our circumstance, but I think it's helpful if we describe our circumstance, confess it to Jesus and say, Jesus, you know, I know that you know what I'm going through, but here is what I'm going through. Point four, they admitted their dependence on God. Verse 12 says, for we have no power against this great multitude that is coming against us, nor do we know what to do but here's the good part. But our eyes are upon you. I encourage you to get your eyes on Jesus in the midst of your circumstance. It can be so difficult. Sometimes it's, it seems easier to focus on the bad circumstance. It's just easier. I think it's our sin, the way we're wired. It's easy to focus, but it can be difficult to focus on Jesus and just to shake it off and say, no, God, I'm going to focus on you. I know that you're true. I know that you're with me. I know that you're faithful. I know that you're sovereign, God. I worship you in the midst of this trial. It feels horrible. It's so difficult. Fear is coming against me, but I know that you're overcoming. I know that you're an overcoming God, and you fill with love. Perfect love casts out fear. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise the name of Jesus. Number five, they received God's instructions. Verses 14 to 17. 
Number six, they chose to step out in faith and follow God's instructions. Sometimes we seek the Lord and we hear from him. It can be, it's difficult to hear from Jesus. It's difficult. We're never 100% sure, but that's why it's faith. So as we pray and seek him and he speaks to us, we think he speaks to us, then take those steps and he will lead and guide. Number seven, they achieved the victory through worship. Hallelujah. Praise the name of Jesus. Now, when they began to sing and to praise, the Lord set ambushes against the people of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir, who had come against Judah, and they were defeated, completely defeated. Hallelujah. And number eight, they gave thanks to God for the victory. This is important to come back and to worship Jesus again and to say, thank you, Jesus. Thank you for seeing me through that time of trial. Thank you for guiding me. Thank you for speaking to me. Thank you that you're faithful. What an amazing example of God's faithfulness to help us in our time of need. Hallelujah. John 4 says, verses 23, 24, John 4 but the hour is coming, and now is, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. And as we heard Harvey share a couple of weeks ago about how God, it's, it's, it's a circle. Worship comes from him and goes back to him as we're faithful as we're faithful, we allow the Spirit of God to worship through us. Hallelujah. To intercede through us. Hallelujah. David, before he became king of Israel, was being pursued by King Saul, who had become jealous of David and wanted to kill him. When David found himself hiding in a cave from King Saul, he wrote this Psalm 57. Psalm 57. <clears throat> be merciful to me, O God, be merciful to me, for my soul trusts in you, and in the shadow of your wings I will make my refuge until these calamities have passed. I will cry out to God most high, to God who forms, performs all things for me. He shall send from heaven and save me. He reproaches the one who would swallow me up, God shall send forth his mercy and his truth. My soul is among lions. I lie among the sons of men who are set on fire, whose teeth are spears and arrows, and their tongue is a sharp sword. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let your glory be above all the earth. They have prepared a net for my steps. My soul is bowed down. They have dug a pit before me. Into the midst of it, they themselves have fallen. My heart is steadfast, O God. My heart is steadfast. I will sing and give praise. Awake, my glory. Awake, lute and harp. I will awaken the dawn. I will praise you, O Lord, among the peoples. I will sing to you among the nations. For your mercy reaches unto the heavens and your truth unto the clouds. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let your glory be above all the earth. Hallelujah! Hallelujah! Jesus is alive. Jesus is worthy. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Please stand with me. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Do you find yourself in a situation this morning like King Jehoshaphat where you did not know what to do? Do you find yourself facing a time of intense trial or feeling of hopelessness and you don't know which direction to turn? Or maybe feeling like you're at a point at a dead end in your life where you just don't know how to get through the situation that's facing you. If that's you, Jesus is here to meet you this morning. He wants you to acknowledge your dependence upon Him and to reach out to Him in worship and adoration and to surrender and commit your life and plans 
into his hands. He will meet you. I can promise you that. God's word says that he will answer when we call upon his name. He is willing and ready to answer you as you reach out to him in worship. He's the reason we come here on a Sunday morning together. Amen. To worship him, to hear his voice, to meet with him and to glorify his name. He also desires us to meet with him on a daily basis. He wants that intimacy with us. If you aren't meeting with him on a daily basis, don't feel condemned. That's the trick of the enemy. The enemy wants to tell us that you've been unfaithful. You can't do it. You might as well just give up. That's the enemy speaking. That's not Jesus. Jesus is there with his arms open wide to come, to embrace you, to draw you into a close relationship, intimate relationship with him. He so desires our intimacy and fellowship. He is so worthy. He is so worthy. Jesus, you are so worthy. You are the King of kings and the Lord of lords. God, it's our desire to see your kingdom come here on earth as it is in heaven. It's our desire to walk with you, to talk with you, to know you intimately, Father. I pray, God, for people here who are struggling right now, going through a trial in their life. It might be a season that has been very, very long and difficult. It may be years. But God, regardless of the circumstance and the situation, you are sovereign, you are in control. And as we focus on you, God, as we worship you, Jesus, trusting in you, help us to trust you, Jesus. Help us to turn our eyes to you, God, for you created us, you know us individually, you know us corporately as a church, as a body of believers. God, you desire good and not evil. You have a good plan for each one of us. God, I pray, Jesus, for each person here, that, Lord, they'd have your perspective, God. They'd have your perspective, Jesus, for we are seated in heavenly places with the King of Kings, and we are heirs, joint heirs with Jesus. Hallelujah.